All right, well, good morning. Camera's on. We're going to go ahead and begin 1 John. 1 John chapter 3 is where we are. We're going to finish uh, that today. And uh, um, we uh, noted when we began studying in 1 John chapter 3 that uh, the entire uh, epistle of 1 John is really built around the application of the two great commandments. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. And in uh, 1 John, it's love your brother. And so that's, uh, that's a very important uh, component for understanding this book. So uh, fellowship with the uh, Son of God is congruous with righteousness, and righteous, our righteousness, our doing that which is righteous, proves our love for God. And uh, that was the subject of verses 4 through 10. And then it also shows our love for the brethren, and that was in verses 11 through 18, and we looked at those last week. And the chapter concludes with the summation of all that truth, and which is essentially our life in the Spirit, and verses 19 through 24. So we're going to go ahead and uh, read uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 through 24. Uh, Brother Cha, if you'd uh, start us out at verse number 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and not all things. Amen. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Um. Oh. Um, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of, the, of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby... We know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. And uh, so previously, uh, we, we ex uh, considered the necessity of, of loving our brethren in the church. And that, boy, that can be a hard thing for some Baptist people. <laughs> I, I've been in Baptist churches my entire life. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been in Baptist churches where... One person sits on that side, and another person sits on that side, and as, as long as uh, they never have to be near each other, then things are kind of okay, but as soon as they get close to each other, sparks fly, uh, contention, strife, uh, it, uh, some ugly things happen. But, maybe they should uh, read First John, amen? <laughs> uh, our text this morning begins with the words, and hereby, which indicates that, that there's really no uh, uh, topic change coming. The subject is still brotherly love. And in fact, love, brotherly love is declared to be proof that we are of the truth. Which, which in uh, 1 John 1 and 2 was, was called walking in the light. And uh, our hearts are not always confident. Some people are very confident people, but our hearts aren't always confident. And that's uh, because, uh, I think in the Christian, as it applies to our, our faith, uh, if we read the Bible, and most of the Bible is Old Testament, and the law is in the Old Testament, and uh, if we read the Bible, we see that the law lacks compassion. The law offers us no consolation. It doesn't put its arm around our shoulders. The law only points at us with a finger of condemnation. It beats up on us, as it were. And, and really God meant it to be that way. Since the law condemns us, we might be prone to discouragement. And, and perhaps even a sense of hopelessness, uh, certainly, uh, if we only had the law. Because what hope could there be of, of uh, pleasing God? If do this and thou shalt live, well, who can do it? it it's, it's not something that we're going to be able to. So some believers really struggle with doubt. 
Uh, they have a very sensitive heart. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think having an insensitive heart, in other words, uh, uh, that's not so bad, you know, uh, that can be a very dangerous thing. Um, we should be aware that that is not, though, how God wants us to be. God doesn't want us to be uh, uh, discouraged. God doesn't want us to have a sense of hopelessness as if we could never please God. I, I had a pastor friend, and I thought he was, or think, he's retired now, but I think he was a very fine pastor, and he, he took a church, and, 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 and he built that church, I think, probably from about 100, 150 when he took it over to about 600 and and a lot of people got saved a lot of good things happened under his ministry but almost the entire time of his ministry he struggled with doubt he constantly doubted his own salvation he constantly doubted that God could love him and I think it, it, and he told me uh, shortly before his retirement that that he spent most of his ministry uh, uh, trying to prove that he was worthy of the love of God. Well, that is not how God wants us to be. And when we read this passage, I think it's very clear God doesn't want us uh, uh, to be like that. And I, 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 I admired that pastor because he didn't make light of sin. And a lot of, a lot of people do. Uh, and he knew that, that God was holy, and God was righteous, and uh, so that's what he wanted to be, but at the same time, he realized that the older he got, how far short of the right, of the holiness of God and the righteousness of God that, that he could actually accomplish. Uh, the law, the law does condemn us. So that we, the reason it condemns us is so that, just a minute brother, it, it condemns us so that we don't ever think that, that we can point to our own goodness for justification in the eyes of God. Because what a lot of people do in order to justify themselves is they don't, so much point to their own goodness, but they point to somebody who's a lot worse than them and say, see how much better I am than this person. And so they behave like the Pharisee when the, when the, when the publican was beating his breast and wouldn't even look up to heaven and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And then the other guy just said, well, <laughs> Lord, I am so much better than that guy. He's this and he's this and he's this and I'm none of those things. And so that's, that's what the law is doing. Brother, brother, you, you want to... Yeah, so I have, I have a question. So can people be saved by listening to forced teachers? Well, yeah. I, I think a lot of people have just a good example of that is the Seventh-day Adventists. Mm. Seventh-day Adventism is a cult. It's, it's not a branch or a denomination of Christianity. It's a cult. And Seventh-day Adventism, uh, they, they teach, for instance, that there is no hell that when somebody dies without faith in Christ, they just cease to exist. They're, they're annihilated. They're burned up. And that God is too loving to actually allow somebody to suffer in a fiery hell for all eternity. And so they deny Scripture. And, uh, but there have been people that have gone to Southern Baptist churches, and because the Southern Baptist, or not Southern Baptist, excuse me, the Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, in spite of saying you have to, you have to, you know, worship on the Sabbath on Saturday. If you worship on yeah. Sunday, it's the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you have to. Most most uh, seven day Adventists uh, will teach that it's sinful to eat meat, not just pork, mm -hmm. meat. Period. Any meat to eat any kind of meat. Uh, I I worked with a guy who was a seven day Adventist, and. Uh, he said he, he didn't necessarily believe that, but almost everybody in his church believed that. And so, so he just went along with the program. They believed that if you ate any meat, then, then you were, at best, you were like a second class. Uh, but if you, you know, if you ate, uh, if you ate pork and, and shrimp, well, then you were, that's just evidence of that, 
you don't have the, the Spirit of Christ. And so they're very much a works-based, and yet, in their doctrinal statement, the, the, the Seventh-day Adventists will say that salvation is by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ. And so some people have gotten saved in the Seventh-day Adventist church. So, good question. Now, uh, the last thing I think I said just a moment ago was that the law rightly condemns us so that uh, we can't point to our own goodness, the things that we've done for justification in the eyes of God, uh, but instead we can be cleansed by His blood. Go back to chapter 1, and let's read those verses again, verses uh, 7 through 10. Chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sins. And if we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So just as the blood in the Old Testament dispensation, uh, when the high priest went into the most holy place, and he sprinkled blood on the mercy seat, the, the covering of the Ark of the Covenant to make atonement for the sin uh, of the people. Uh, the, when, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, His blood is applied, and that's all that's necessary for our atonement. We don't have to, we don't have to uh, do anything else. We don't have to be saved. Or, I, excuse me, we don't, uh, we don't have to be saved again, is really what I meant to be said, you know. Because, you know, and that's what, but there are, there are some denominations that will teach that. They'll, they'll teach, oh, boy, boy, you did this sin, uh, you lost your salvation. You need to be saved again. Yeah, so there are some people that think you need to be saved again. There are some people that think that, uh, you know, you're not saved unless you've been baptized. Uh, and... Uh, uh, there are others that, you know, you have to be a member of this church, or maybe you have to, you know, do some sort of continuing uh, good works. But that isn't what saves us. That isn't what keeps us saved. When we get saved, we become a new creature. And the purpose in making us a new creature is so that we can serve God. And uh, so since we're new, our walk and our conversation... Uh, not not our speech, but I mean conversation in the in the King James Bible sense. It's our whole manner of life should reflect our new birth. The professing Christian who continues as he was before he got saved, you know, the only difference is now he attends church on Sundays. He doesn't really have a whole lot to commend him, right? Uh, he lives without spiritual victory. And he lives without answers to prayer, probably because he doesn't pray. Uh, I don't you know, think that uh, um, people really pray that much if, if they don't see answers to prayer, if they don't see a whole lot of point to the... Now, I know the Muslims, they pray, but you know, and so do the Roman Catholics, but... But their, their hope, they don't expect their prayers to be answered. A Roman Catholic, when the Roman Catholic is sitting there praying through the beads on the subway, you, you know, they're not expecting answers to prayer. They're, they're hoping that they're earning something by doing that. And that's the same way with the Muslim. When the Muslim throws down their, their, their little rug and they face east towards Mecca, or wherever they are in the world, and they, they begin saying these vain, repetitious prayers, they're not really asking God for you know, their situation to change. They're just hoping that it makes a difference after they die. But uh, the Bible tells us something completely different. The Christian, however, the man who claims to be a Christian, and he lives his life without spiritual victory, without answers to prayer, uh, probably, I think, his own conscience 
pounding and hounding him. God's word won't be a joy to him, probably because he finds it disturbing. That's what the word of God is supposed to do. The word of God is sharp as a sword. You get poked by a sword, it's kind of disturbing. The word of God is like a hammer. You ever, you ever go for the nail and hit your thumb instead? That hammer can disturb you. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 the, the Word of God, you know, will do that to an unconverted soul. It will also do it even to a Christian who's, whose heart is not right with God. But how can anyone assure their own hearts that they're truly a child of God? That's what this verse says, 19. And hereby we know that that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Now, Reformed theology says that, you know, perseverance is the answer. Uh, I, I know a bit about this because I, I grew up, I wasn't a Calvinist, but everybody around me was. Uh, I grew up in Holland, Michigan, where, where in my high school there was uh, maybe two Catholics, uh, there, was, there was two of us who were Baptist, we all went. <laughs> We both went to the same church, and three of us, I guess, and uh, and then the other the other hundred or so that were in my graduating class, they all went to church. Everybody did. They either went to the Reformed or the Christian Reformed church, and they were all Calvinists. And uh, you know, so I've heard all the explanations of of Calvinism, and uh, one thing that Calvinists are big on is perseverance. That, but perseverance, it, to me, when, when you see it played out in, in, a, in a, uh, a, a Calvinist life, it, it sounds suspiciously like Satan in, in, uh, in Isaiah 14. He said, I will ascend. I will, I will, I will, I will be like the Most High. And, and that's, that's kind of, in a way, that's kind of what uh, perseverance is to, to somebody that uh, it, it is in the Reformed faith. It, it sounds also like the one who is unknown by the Lord in, in Matthew chapter 7. You know that passage in Matthew 7, 20, 21 through 23? The the one who said, Lord, in the, in the day of judgment, Lord, haven't I done this? I've cast out devils in your name. I've done mighty works in your name. Mm -hmm. And what does Jesus say to him? Uh, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. I never knew you. Depart from me that work, work iniquity. And, and so when we try to do good works to earn our salvation, what we're doing is rejecting what Jesus did. We're saying that what we did it is of equal value or greater value than what Christ did. And uh, so, uh, um, if, if, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart. And uh, he knoweth all things. So John's epistle helps us persuade our hearts. And, and how does that work? Well, as we read on here in verses uh, 20, for if our heart condemn us, if you're struggling with doubt as, as a believer, if your heart condemns you, we have confidence, have confidence towards God in whatsoever we ask we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Nothing gives a Christian confidence like seeing prayers answered. Now, prayers can't be answered if they're not offered. If we don't pray, God's under no obligation to answer the prayers that we won't bring to Him. But, but I think uh, uh, answered prayer is the key to our having the confidence that God wants us to have. Here's the thing. The more that we love, the more that we'll pray. Because if we love our, our brothers, 
we will pray for them. We will pray that God blesses them. We'll pray for the, those who are sick. We'll pray for those who have, who have physical and spiritual needs. We'll pray for them because, because we love them. And then we'll be able to ask God in greater confidence because we're keeping His commandments and doing those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is how we disarm our own condemning heart and conscience uh, 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 and have confidence towards God. And according to our text, this is, this is an imperative. In verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. I wasn't taught this when I was younger. I wasn't taught this when I was in Bible college. I wasn't taught that if you have doubts, that you should love. I was taught, here's the rule book, keep it. <laughs> Do this and this and this, and you'll look better than those people over there who aren't doing it. That's what I was taught. But that isn't what God wants us to do. God is not concerned so much with how we look as with what we really are. And if we are what we're supposed to be, we'll do what we're supposed to do. So, now, I, there's, there's nothing wrong with having a heart that's sensitive to our own failures and shortcomings. That's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. But it's not our sin that we, that we commit that condemns us. Because our sin has been adequately dealt with by the blood of Jesus Christ. We just need to confess our sins and forsake them because we have the promise that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if we really do love Christ, uh, we can say uh, as confidently as Peter in John 21, 17, when Jesus said to Peter the third time, Lovest thou me? And Peter said, Lord, thou knowest I love you. You know everything, Lord, so you know that I love you. So Christian, do God's will, and your heart won't condemn you. Now, I, I've, I, I know plenty of preachers, I've heard them say, you know, every Christian has, has doubts, and some of, I think what they meant is doubts about whether or not they're really saved. I, I think whenever preachers are, are dealing with doubt, it would probably be better if they were specific. You know, we can... <coughs> some maybe some people are doubting whether or not what they're doing is is God's will. Uh, but I think I think we can have perfect peace about that as well. I think we can have full assurance and confidence in our heart, even if everybody seems to be against us, that we're doing the will of God. There's there the Bible shows us steps that we can take uh, to know that we are in the perfect will of God, just as Romans 12, 1 and 2 say. Uh, but I don't think, I don't think that every Christian has doubts about their salvation. And I don't think that God wants us to have doubts about our salvation. Christians don't need to have doubts about their salvation. They don't need to doubt that God loves them. No one, no one who keeps God's word and who does God's will with their life will doubt their salvation. You, you couldn't keep God's word, and you couldn't, you couldn't do as Christ and love like Christ if you didn't know Christ. You couldn't do it. So I, I don't think that the Apostle Paul ever doubted his salvation after he got saved. Do you think he did? There's no record in Scripture that he ever doubted his salvation. I'll tell you what. I don't think 
that Peter doubted his salvation, even though he denied Christ. If we keep his commandments, then we are dwelling in him and he in us, and this gives us full assurance that he abides in us by the Spirit of God. So, if we are living in the Spirit, we can keep His commandments. If we are not living in the Spirit, even if we keep His commandments, it's still a work of the flesh. Moral men who don't believe in God, and there are plenty of moral men that don't believe in God, uh, they don't keep God's commandments. They might, they might do it simply because they have character and discipline, self-discipline. Yes. But they don't, they don't keep all the commandments in the Bible. They might look good. They don't obey the Bible. Those who reject Christ uh, for their own uh, goodness and for their own self-righteousness and say, I, I don't need that bloody religion. I think we just need to be good and God will accept us. Uh, uh, they, they don't keep the Bible's commandments. So, uh, uh, in order to keep the Bible's commandments, I think for a New Testament Christian, it means that we're exercising our spiritual gifts. I am I'm very much convinced that, that uh, if we are not exercising our spiritual gifts, we are not walking in the Spirit. We're not doing the will of God for our life. It's not God's will for every Christian to go be a missionary. It's not even God's will for, for every Christian man to become a deacon in their church. Uh, God gives differing gifts to differing uh, people in the church according to His according to his wisdom. And when we exercise our spiritual gifts in the church, we're being a blessing to our brothers. We're building them up. We're edifying them. And, and, and that is demonstrating genuine love. Genuine love is, is doing what's good for somebody even when they don't want you to do it even when they don't value it. You're still going to do what's good for them. So somebody who isn't doing the will of God for their life, they're not living in the Spirit, I think that they're going to probably have doubts, possibly even doubts about their salvation, doubts about, you know, is their life ma does their life matter? Is their life accomplishing some, some purpose or the purpose of God? Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, uh, that's that's why I think this is so important. It, it it starts out with this idea of love, a John's epistle. We need to love God with all our heart and soul and might. If we do that, we'll be, we the only way we can do that is to have the love of Christ in us. If we have His imputed righteousness, then we then and only then are we capable of showing love to our brothers. And if we really love our brothers, we will do what God saved us to do, which is to use our spiritual gifts. Now, moral men don't seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. They don't try to fulfill the Great Commission. And they probably lack the assurance that this passage is promising, and rightly so. But the man who loves God, and because he loves God, the love of God can go through him and love his brother. And he will then use his spiritual gifts to benefit his brethren and be a blessing to them. And uh, uh, I think that's uh, where, where John is going. We'll continue on and look at uh, chapter 4. Uh, when we come back next week. Shall we close in prayer? 
Uh, Lord, thank you for your love for us.